welcome to the show. It's me, John Park. It's time for John Park's workshop, and here we are, uh, ready to go. It's been an exciting morning uh, and early afternoon getting prepped for the show today. All kinds of things were breaking, so it's going to be exciting and fun. Uh, and I'm full of coffee, so let's do it. Uh, hey, thanks for stopping by over in the chat. I know that we've got C. Grover who just uh, popped in over here in our Discord chat, which looks a lot like that right there. And if you want to join in our chat, if you're wondering where are all these people talking, that's it. It's our Discord. It's adafru.it slash Discord. You'll get an instant invite and you'll want to head over to the live broadcast chat channel. Uh, we do have a whole bunch of other channels, however, that are great for project help, uh, help with Circuit Python, help with 3D printing, show and tell, off topic, pet photos, all kinds of great things there. Uh, so, hello, Andy Calloway, Gary Z, Abadouz, Abadouz, I don't know how to say your name, I'm sorry. Uh, nice to see you all, and hey, Dale, uh, thanks for stopping by over in the YouTube chat. I do have that one open, and I can keep an eye on it. And I got my iPad over there, so. Hopefully I'll be able to see uh, what's going on in the chat while I'm at the workbench today, which we'll be spending some time over there. I've got some stuff set up that I'm excited about. Uh, but first of all, let's do some, uh, some housekeeping. So first of all, I want to mention our jobs board. If you are looking for work, if you are looking to hire someone, uh, this is a great place to check out. It is the Adafruit job board, jobs.adafruit.com. Uh, let me bring, bring up my web page here, and uh, that's not it, but this will be. Just go to jobs.adafruit.com. You can see here, uh, someone's looking for a creative engineer fabricator in mechatronics at ShopCat in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, that's a pretty new posting, posting as of last week. And you can see there's even some positions filled here. We'll edit it if it opens again. So there's, there's uh, some movement going on over there on jobs.adafruit.com. It doesn't cost anything to use. You can uh, just go there and fill in your information if you're looking to post your resume info or if you're looking to uh, put a job placement. We won't automatically uh, include that. It actually is all uh, vetted through uh, PT and Lemoore, so they will have a look at things to see if they sort of uh, are a good fit for our community. So uh, that's where you'll find some, some good job info, jobsatedfruit.com. Uh, I've got this show on Tuesdays, right there. It's called JP's Product Pick of the Week. Sometimes it looks like this. That's what it looked like this week. And every week I go through a product. Sometimes it's brand new. Sometimes it's an oldie but goodie like this one. This is product ID 259, so a pretty early one. I think we're up into the 5,000s right now for IDs in our, in our store. I go through a product, I show you how it works, go through the specs, take a look at the data sheet if there is one, do some coding examples if that's pertinent. And there's a huge discount. This week it was 50% off on this great USB LiPo charger. Here's a little one minute recap in case you missed it. The USB LiPo battery charger. It charges in three stages. It does a preconditioning, it does a fast charge, and then it does a trickle charge. It tells us that we have power with a little red LED here. And then there's this indicator that is yellow right now that tells me this is charging. And then when it gets to a full charge and it's just doing the trickle, that LED turns off and we instead get the done or green LED to light up. So if I have battery plugged in, you'll see that immediately powers up the device. Now if I want to start charging this, I can just plug in and it won't interrupt anything. You can see the uh, power is still running over here. There's no, no uh, hiccups there. And now we are driving this either off of available battery uh, power or over the USB. It's never going never gonna to turn that device off. The USB LiPo battery charger.
All right, let's get set up for this. I've just got to bring up my coding window. Uh, is Mike off? When was Mike off? Was Mike off when I said, let's do the CircuitPython Parsec? Oh, I think we're back now, so hopefully that, that uh, is all good. Thanks for the warning over there in the chat, over in the Discord. Mike, yeah, I guess I, I came on without a mic. How about now? Have you got any audio? Did you hear the, uh, the Parsec song? My software is claiming, claiming that I'm making sounds. Let me check the chat. Audio good now, thanks. Okay, good. Great to know that that's working before we dive into this. And now let me bring up my little coding window here. Uh, all right, let's jump over to this example. For the CircuitPython Parsec today, I wanted to show you how you can scan a Wi-Fi network using an ESP32-S2 based microcontroller. Right here you'll see I have a Feather ESP32-S2 and I have a little, just a tiny little bit of code here that you can see that allows us to scan the networks. So here's how the code works. It imports Wi-Fi, then we set up a little uh, list called networks, it's empty to start with. Then for network in Wi-Fi radio, start scanning networks it appends the name to that little array. Then we stop scanning the networks, we sort those based on the strength of the signal, and then we print those out. So here you can see when this runs, my little antenna there just sniffed around and it found three SSIDs and it gives us our signal strength on those. I think the strongest is the lowest number there. And then it's done running. I don't know if we'll get any different results if I kind of wave it up in, in, the, in the air. Let's. Uh, rerun that. So I'm going to hit control D. Whoops. Let me hit control D and run that. And hey, we picked up one more just by virtue of me holding that up a little bit higher. So you can imagine you could bolt a little screen on there and have a little Wi-Fi SSID sniffer that's pretty portable. Maybe put a little battery on it. And that's how easy it is to sniff for Wi-Fi networks using CircuitPython. And that's been your CircuitPython Parsec. So that was actually, I'm so glad that went well uh, once we got the mics sorted out because that was one where when I, I had, this was fresh out of the bag, I hadn't used this Feather ESP32 S2, and it was one of the few that shipped out early and didn't have a bootloader on it. I had to go through the sort of fresh bootload using the ESP tool on, uh, on Chrome to get this thing flashed, and at first I was like, uh-oh, am I going to make this in time? It was kind of a last second thing, so whew, glad that worked. Uh, and uh, thanks to our good friend Todd Bot, who can't join us, he's not... Uh, not in the chat today on the show, but Todd Bot had a nice example code on Hub for doing a little uh, Wi-Fi sniffing. Uh, I also imagine that, I can't remember if this one is a, I don't think this one is, but the, this one has a coprocessor. Uh, the different Pi portals have an ESP32 coprocessor, if I recall correctly, and a uh, M4 chip maybe as the main chip. So these may be able to reuse that code. That code of just importing Wi-Fi, that's pretty specific to the ESP32. Um, oh no, we have some buffering going on. Well, that's too bad. Uh, so I had started that project originally using one of our airlifts, but I think the code I needed for that is different. I uh, couldn't just install uh, using Circup, install the Wi-Fi. All right, uh, so hopefully the, the streaming buffers will clear out uh, looks like it's still still running in some locales. Looks like, uh, in fact, the uh, Facebook stream looks pretty pretty good. I don't know what's going on with YouTube, so I'll give that a minute uh, to calm itself down. Andy says it's good now. All right, great. I suppose I could. Yeah, it's funny. The the health warnings I get on YouTube don't seem to have a lot to do with reality. Uh, they're they're not very helpful, unfortunately. So. Uh, if we're good to go then, what I want to do is start talking about the project of the week, which involves this guy right over here. Uh, so let me, let me move my uh, base of operations over to the workbench. Head on over here. So 
I'm gonna grab my coffee on the way over there. So you may recall, uh, some people may recall, I had, oh, I've got a light out, let's see. Is it gonna, hey, whoa, that's bright. Okay, uh, I had picked up this at an estate sale and this was probably a couple months ago. It's a lovely Model 500 uh, Western Electric telephone, real standard, sort of in the US at least, this is, this is the phone uh, that we had here for decades and decades. I grew up with these before touch tone became uh, as common. And it's a rotary dial phone. You never owned these. These were always on loan to you by Bell Systems uh, or, or whichever local Bell you had once those started to split up. Uh, built like a tank. And what I wanted to do was tap into this rotary dial mechanism today. Uh, so for those of you not familiar, the way these phones were dialed was put your finger in a number, go to the right, let go, and it clicks a little switch a certain number of times. So it just pulsed that switch six times so that would register as a six, register as a nine, and so on. Uh, so let's take a look inside of it. We'll take it apart, get inside of there, and then talk about how we can read those pulses and use them to create an interface. Um, you may recall, actually, I've done a similar project before using this old lineman's handset. It's the same mechanism. Uh, this was a, a, a butt set or a Batinsky or a lineman's handset used uh, to climb up a pole, hook onto a line, see if it's working, and still be able to, to dial numbers. Uh, mechanically, it's just a little bit different. You can see that the, the finger stop moves just because it's in a, such a compact area. Um, and I had to modify this one so that I could have the dial going directly to these leads rather than work uh, internally with the mechanism. When I did that project before, I actually clipped it onto a Circle Playground Express and I was using uh, make code to do it. Today what we're gonna do is tap into the dial sort of a little more properly and we'll use CircuitPython in order to read pulses and then write them out as USB numbers. So one, two, up through zero will actually get written out over USB as if we're typing those on a keyboard. So that's my idea with this. Uh, so first of all, we have RJ11 uh, and I think these might be RJ10, which are the two line uh, plugs for the handset and the four line uh, plug for going into the wall. I will actually, my plan is, uh, use a bit of uh, phone cord to make a USB cable that can plug into this phone without having to modify it that much. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how, we, how we do on that. It's kind of a long line and I don't think it's shielded, so it could be a disaster, but we'll find out. Uh, so this is um, the pair of screws here that will unscrew to release the shell. So it's mostly just a shell sitting on top of pretty much everything else. Uh, so I'm just gonna dive in here and uh, oh Andy Calloway found where Lars moved to. That's disturbing. A little more. There we go. Okay, so there's the shell, and we won't need that for now. Uh, there's really nothing much going on there. So I will set those about right here in front of Lars. Uh, and now we get to, uh, get to the guts of this. So you'll see there are a couple of these jacks for the handset and the main line, and I think we'll tap into this one, into these wires, to create our USB uh, connection there. And then as far as the uh, dial goes, I think we should we should pull this off to take a look at it. We actually, uh, it's got wiring coming off of the bottom of the pulse dialing mechanism that is connected up to this block here, which is uh, sort of the guts of the phone. And what we'll do is just loosen a couple of screws here and you can see, getting a call, there are some retaining clips that just pop out 
on each side here and here. Uh, so by the way, I'm not going to try to do anything with the ringer on here. I think these ring at 48 volts uh, DC, or it might, might be that's the steady line and it's even higher when it rings. So you need quite a, quite a bit of uh, power to, to use this internal mechanism here. So I'm not, I'm not going to be messing with that for, for this project at least. Um, but this is the very cool... Uh, dialing mechanism, and the way these work is they have a uh, a little mechanical governor that allows them to rotate at a constant rate. So as we turn that, let's turn to a zero, uh, you should be able to see a little flywheel here and a little governor mechanism and gearing that just like with a watch or a clock, it makes it move at a consistent rate. And that rate is important because the way the phone system worked at at that time when these were in use, and actually some phone lines will still uh, work with pulse dialing, and even some modems, uh, like cable modems and things like that, will allow you to use pulse dialing, and then it converts that into a digital signal, uh, or, a, or a modern digital signal, uh, to send to your sort of voice over IP style phone line. Uh, so this has two pairs of wires coming off of it. And one of them is just simply to let the phone know that dialing has begun. And so that is a uh, normally open switch that closes uh, when, when this moves at all. And that's the pair of white uh, wires on here. And that is used just to disconnect the um, uh, sound from going to the earpiece. So you just don't hear all the loud dialing sounds in your ear. Uh, that's all that one does. So as soon as, soon as this moves, that's going to turn off. And we'll, we'll uh, actually, let's tap into that right now just to, just to do this uh, as we go. So I have a photo that I took of this so I know where these lines uh, go. It doesn't actually matter which, which block the white wires go to, the pair of them, but I did mark them. Uh, and the wires have been in this thing so long. Uh, I think this phone's probably from the 50s or, or early 60s that the wires kind of have a memory of where they go. So this right here, if we take a multimeter and just put it into continuity test mode, I'll hook up to these two wires. And you'll hear we don't have any continuity until we begin dialing. So as soon as it starts, uh, that closes that switch and that tells the system to disconnect the earpiece from the rest of the phone so we're not hearing all of the dialing sounds in our ear. See, it's just any dialing that's happening, it's, it's closing that switch. And then as soon as it finishes, it lets that switch open again. So that's the white switch. We could use that for something. Uh, for example, uh, light up an LED or something like that to know that some dialing is taking place. That's, that's one way we could do it. Um, and then these other two, these little blue wires here, we'll, we'll bring the phone back into this, uh, but for today at least I want to get in where. Uh, and if you look closely here, let me... What you'll see, and this has a little... Uh, I don't know if I can remove this little plastic cover here. I probably can. Oh, it's kind of molded to, to this. I don't think I want to pop it off. Oh, I've popped it off. Okay. Uh, that's just some shielding for, for keeping things from uh, contacting. So you can see there's these little leafy uh, contacts that touch or don't touch. They're sort of springy depending on what's going on with the mechanism. So the, uh, the white wire line, those are uh, apart from each other until a little cam uh, moves and then the two contact each other and that's what closes that switch. Uh, opposite is true for the um, blue line, which is the individual pulses. Those are uh, normally closed and then each uh, pulse of the the number dial spinning uh, opens them for about 50 milliseconds or so. So if we connect up to 
this, we, we probably won't hear a perfect, uh, I don't think my multimeter is fast enough maybe. So we're going to hear it get interrupted a certain number of times. All right, so it actually would have been at six times, but the, my meter isn't fast enough. Okay, so the meter's not able to capture that fast enough. Uh, but what's going on is it is uh, closed, and then it'll, if you dial a three, it'll go open one, two, three times, and it'll send those three pulses. Um, and so that's why this timing is important, because those pulses need to be within a, a pretty small margin of error about, um, what is it, I think 10 to 20 milliseconds uh, uh, apart so that they're considered part of a sequence. So we're dialing a three and not three individual ones, for example. Um, so what we'll do, again, I'll, I'll set the phone aside for now, but what we're gonna do is use a microcontroller. In this case, I've got this, um, let me zoom out a little bit. I've got a cutie pie here uh, that I was testing things with, and I'm using a pull-up resistor and a debouncer in code so that we can just simply connect one side of the uh, dial pulses to ground and the other to a digital input pin. And I happen to be using the RX pin in this case. Uh, so with this setup, what we should get is a, um, a switch that is normally uh, closed and that means it's heading to, I believe that means it's heading to low, and then for each pulse as it opens, it'll head high, and we'll register that, uh, that change, sort of edge detection in the debouncer, and then be able to do something with that. Uh, so what we'll do at this time is uh, take this over to the workbench, plug it in. I was having some problems with this particular microcontroller right before uh, the show started as well, so we may uh, do some, some uh, reconfiguring of things uh, and I might not be able to use the breadboard, but I should be able to just hold the, uh, hold the contacts down on this one, which I think I'll use this in the final one. I don't really need any sort of proto board for this. Uh, my idea will be to run wiring, uh, from this plug, which has three wires in it right now. So we'll need four to do, um, USB. And so that'll power and data, uh, give us power and data on this. And then uh, I'll have a couple of these little alligator clips like I did here, just running back to the terminal blocks uh, on here if that works or we can disconnect them from the dialer and go directly. So let's take this over here and see what we can get working. And let me know, I've, I can keep an eye on Discord, so let me know if you have any questions or thoughts. Okay, so I will try this arrangement of things. This should work. Uh, I'll pause over there. Uh, QZorn on YouTube asks if that's the phone Lily Tomlin used on Laugh In. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, first things first. Let me just see if I can get this uh, Cutie Pie recognized. I don't know what was happening with it before when it was, yeah, so it's blinking. Um, let me see what you can see. Yeah, so that was blinking on there. And let me go over to, yeah, I don't see it showing up. Uh, it's not happy. Let's just see if we can, um, let me see if I can reset it. Okay. Let me just try to put um, CircuitPython back on it. Uh, well, we'll need to download that. Okay, let me, I'll show you in the browser where I'm going for fun. So here's, um, we'll just go to circuitpython.org, head to downloads. I'll do RP2040, QDPI. Oh, it doesn't like that order. QDPI RP, there it is. And I'll download this 7.1.1 UF2 file. Uh, and then you're not seeing this right now, but in my finder, uh, I see the rpi-rp2 
drive show up, USB drive show up, and so I'm just going to drag this UF2 onto it. Uh, and that actually should, if that uh, works the way it typically does, um, that should give us um, all of our libraries and code that were already on there. It, it, good chance it's going to be preserved. Uh, so it just flashed the thing, it's restarted, and it's showing up now as a circuit pi drive. So that's good. Okay, so now you can see, let me hide this. Now you can see over in, oops, over in Atom, I should be able to open code.py off of that drive. Oh, yeah, okay, so the thing got reset. That's right, so I'll paste in, so I'm just repasting this. Uh, one thing that'll happen here is there may be some uh, libraries like HID and debouncer that are just not by default on that um, image of circuit Python. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll open up the uh, serial REPL here, and then I'm going to save this code onto that drive. Uh, and what it'll probably do is error, import error, no module named Adafruit HID. Uh, so again, this is something you won't see. I, I've shown this before in CircuitPython Parsec. I'm just going to open up a terminal window, and in there I'm going to type in circup, C-I-R-C-U-P, it's like for CircuitPython update, install Adafruit underscore HID. It's going to go grab that file uh, and any associated ones that it needs uh, and put it on the, on the disk. Oh, it said that there was a problem downloading the bundle. Please try again in a moment. Huh, I wonder why. Hmm. All right, so I'll do the manual way. <laughs> What's going on there? Uh, so I can go back to uh, circuitpython.org, head up to libraries, and I'll just download the library bundle. This means that I will just need to manually drag and drop libraries over. I don't know what's going on with CircUp. That's bizarre. Uh, so that downloaded a zip file that I'll open up. And again, sorry, you won't see this part just because I don't have a, a screen share for this. Uh, I'm going into the CircuitPython bundle library directory, and I'm opening up the library directory on my uh, QtPy there. And then I'll drag over Adafruit HID. And it'll copy that over. And then if we keep an eye on um, the REPL there, it'll then find the next thing that's missing that it's trying to import, which is debouncer. So I can uh, find that. I'm juggling a lot of windows. I'll find debouncer. Um, where'd you go, debouncer? He's not alphabetical. Debouncer, there you are, okay. Uh, and I'll drag that into my uh, library on the CircuitPython drive as well, and then we'll check out the next. Uh, okay, so no errors, I think. That's good, so I'll, I'll go, uh, oh, no. No module named Adafruit ticks. What is it missing there? Hmm. That's a new one on me. Eight of root ticks. Where are you? Hey, there it is. Eight of root ticks. Something has changed. All right. And now, again, we'll check the output here. And I can hit Control D to um, goose the board. Okay, so it looks like it's booted and it hasn't run into any problems. Uh, now, since the way the uh, dial is going to work, it's just uh, closing this and opening this contact. You can see uh, there it counted pulses uh, and, oops, it also typed for me. Uh, so that's good. That means things are working. Uh, what I'll do is let's make a little comment area here so we can safely USB uh, type. And then what I'm going to do is hook up the uh, blue wires to so these two alligator clip leads. 
These are really convenient, by the way. I don't know if you've seen these in the Adafruit store. They're little um, cable assemblies that have a header pin on one end and a um, alligator clip on the other end come in a few colors. Uh, okay, so let's try, uh, I'll dial a one. And you'll see there it counted one pulse and uh, in my sort of serial print output. And then up here where my cursor is, I can type things in there and so can the circuit pi drive. So this is, you can, you can mess yourself up pretty well with this, but you can go type in a nine, type in a five, seven. So that's working pretty well. So let's take a look at the code uh, and see what's happening there. Also, I will keep an eye on my Discord to make sure we don't have any issues. Yeah, oh, thanks, Michael. Michael says, Debouncer requires ticks now. I did not know. Uh, so here's, here's what's going on in code. I'm importing uh, the board and time libraries for board pin definitions, time so I can wait for stuff, pause. Uh, digital I.O. so that we can read a, a pin as a digital input. And then HID stuff is all just about being able to type. And then the Adafruit debouncer. Then I'm setting up a uh, pin on the board. In this case, it's board RX. I'm calling this uh, the switch in pin. It's uh, set as a pull up. So it's using the internal pull up resistor on the chip. Uh, and then the switch is the debouncer object that's in that uh, digital I.O. pin. We then set up keyboard, and then I've created a little uh, list here of the things I want it to be able to type. So one through nine and a zero. This could be anything. This could be A, B, C, D, and so on. Uh, but that's what I'm going to use for now. Then I have this little function here that's uh, called read rotary dial pulses. And we set up a, a very specific timeout here which allows us enough time to read one of these pulses based on the govern, governed speed of this dial, uh, but not uh, so long that we get broken up, uh, you know, nine becomes a five and a four. Uh, in this function, the uh, debouncer update happens, so switch.update switch in parentheses. And then I made myself notes here because this always confused me. So yeah, this is a normally closed switch pin so it is pulled low uh, normally, and then it goes high when it um, is opened, which is what's happening every time it, it sort of pulses. So if it has not risen, if it's just hanging out low, then nothing happens, return zero. The pulse count uh, starts off at a one uh, when this gets called, because we've definitely started uh, turning the dial. And then the last pulse time is set to time monotonic, which is just this sort of ongoing clock uh, since, since the device was, was powered up. Uh, while the tom, time monotonic minus the last pulse time is less than whatever that timeout is, that means that this is one set of pulses that, that are together, that are being considered one number, uh, are happening. Switch gets updated. If the switch rises, we increment the pulse count by one. And then we reset that timer so that the next one we can, we can check as well. Uh, and then we return that pulse count, whatever that is. So this function, at the end of the day, it just gives out a pulse count, uh, which you see printed down there below. And then in my main loop here, we're doing the uh, number of pulses equals, go call that function. And then what happens if we get pulses? So if there are pulses, I'm printing out pulses, count equals, and whatever that number is. And then I'm doing my little keyboard send. So keyboard send uh, is a little different than keyboard press because keyboard press also needs keyboard release. Keyboard send is a press and a release, so it's perfect for this type of setup. So keyboard send, key map, and then that's that little list I made, whatever the number of pulses is minus one, and that's just to get to zero indexing. So if the number of pulses is one, then I'm going to use the uh, zero item in this list, which is this key code one. So one ends up being one. Uh, and that's it. That's, that's how simple that is. So you can see here, we'll go and go through the numbers, zero, one, two, three. And so that, that recovery time between uh, dialing is longer than 0.2 seconds. So it doesn't confuse those. It doesn't add them up or anything like that. You're not going to dial a three by dialing a one and a two. 
so it's all based on that sort of very precise timing. Uh, and you can go and look, uh, there's a lot of resources out there on the web about what the, what the timings are on these. And uh, you can see actually what happens if you make this number too low. Let's, let's do 0.1. Uh, now watch, I'm going to dial, let's say, a 6. So it counted that, oops, you can see there, as three twos. Uh, so the, the timing, if we, if we get that timing wrong, there it picked that up as a three. Here it's four two or three twos and a one. Um, so it gets, gets confused if you have uh, too short of a pulse time here. So we'll, we'll leave that at, at the point two that's recommended. Um, let's see, so any questions about that? Uh, let me know. Um, what I want to do, uh, what I want to try next, and this is, this is dangerous because this could be what kind of screwed things up earlier, but I wanted to see, can I get this to dial uh, using my phone? So I'm going to use a, um, a little adapter cable so that I can go from USB to my phone. So I'll unplug this. And let's switch, uh, switch our view here for a second. And let me grab So since I'm using iOS, I've got to use this little weird iOS adapter. I mean, it's not that weird. They just call it a camera adapter, which is weird, but it's really kind of an OTG, uh, which goes from lightning to USB. And now if I plug this into my phone, maybe this is what caused my problems before. I shouldn't. I don't know what caused those problems before. Um, This should, if you look at my phone here, if I dial a four, hey, it's working. So that'll send, uh, that'll send whatever USB, uh, same, same as it sent to the computer. And now let's see if I can use it on the phone app. I actually don't know if it'll allow that. So let's see. Two. <laughs> That's fun. Do you hear the little beep? Let me turn up the volume. All right, it's a super, super inconvenient dialer. Uh, but you can see there, it was, uh, I'm not dialing any number in particular. Uh, it was working, good, I'm excited about that. So uh, what I wanna do now is, uh, oh, there's a question, Wagon Lowe's asks pulse dial to touch tone. Um, yeah, you should be able to do it. I was able to do touch tone dialing on a Circuit Playground Express uh, using our nice little external speaker. I think I have one of them right here. Um, this little speaker up really at the just the right distance from the microphone on a phone uh, will send dual tone multifunction uh, or touch tone. Uh, to the phone. So you could build your own rotary to, to touch tone device, which would be fun. Um, the, uh, yeah, the trickiest thing about that is that touch tone is a pair of oscillators running at two different frequencies. Uh, and so it's pretty hard to do that without threaded uh, sort of multitasking. It may be possible in CircuitPython. It would be way easier to just make some wave files. You can download wave files of each number. So rather than uh, generating your own pair of oscillators per number, because it's this sort of column and row thing, uh, you might be better off just getting a wave and, and playing each of those wave files at the right time. Uh, so let's now see about uh, hooking this up to the phone itself. And this may be something that's, that becomes too fiddly and, and we'll pick it up next week or I'll do it in the interim and show you, show you my uh, progress next week. So let's head back over here. And here's, here's what I was envisioning. I've got uh, the standard phone cable, twisted pairs. Uh, so this is 426 AWG uh, gauge wire. And this one happens to be nice. Some phone wire, if you've ever dealt with it, used to be uh, real, this like foil junk. This is actually copper wire. I've tinned the ends of these, and I can zoom in here a bit. Uh, so this is the wiring. And what I needed to figure out is if we want to go ahead and make 
essentially a USB cable with this phone jack on one end. So I can plug this into the phone, the other end into US, into the computer or my, my iPhone or something like that. Um, I need to know what uh, my wiring pattern is for USB. So I was doing this earlier um, just to test things out. So here is one end I could use, at least just for testing purposes. This is a little breakout that we have, which is a USB uh, A to screw terminals. And these are the uh, positive voltage, uh, negative data line is the white one, I believe. Sorry, uh, positive data line. I made that yellow. Some people make that black and then switch these around. Um, and then I uh, use black as ground. So following that, oh, these, these kind of fell out, but these were temporary. I have another breakout here that I was going to use to go to the um, Cutie Pie, because Cutie Pie doesn't have, where's that spare one? Cutie Pie doesn't have the USB pins broken out. Uh, the KB2040 might be a good choice instead, because it does break out the two USB data, uh, plus and minus, so you could kind of go a little more directly. Um, but this was kind of my idea is use this little plug to plug adapter. And we, we probably have some other better adapter in the store and I just don't have one on me. Uh, so with that arrangement there, we would get um, wiring out to USB. So that means on this end of this guy, I'm gonna sub those for this, and I have a little, um, I'll, I'll just trans, translate white to green on this one, and otherwise I'll keep the coloring the same. So let me put this together here, and I'll get that in focus. Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, Franklin says you can get the jacks from oldphoneshop.com, and they have the, the 500 series and the 2500, which is the touchtone one, uh, modular jack set. Thank you, Franklin. That's great. I'll check that out later. Uh, so there's a link in the Discord if you're wondering. So this will be black, yellow, green, red going from right to left. Black, yellow, red, green. Remind me of that in a second when I forget. No, black, yellow, green, red. Yeah, there we go. Black. Let me arrange these and then do it. Uh, so this is sort of temporary doing the cable this way. Uh, we do have some DIY USB cables um, that might be better suited for the long run, but I'll with this for now. So there's this little sh sort of dance you do to try to get all these. I think I'm going to strip this a little longer so that I can oops, get uh, a little more to work with. Yeah, beware like really flat, floppy phone wire. It's gonna have this garbagey foil stuff that's super annoying to deal with. So if you can get a thicker piece of phone line, that's gonna make life easier. All right, I think I had black, yellow, green, red, right to left as my goal. Let me screw these the rest of the way. Hold on. There we go. So these are these go on top of the little metal contact there. Which then sort of pinches and elevates them up. Not all of them work that way. Some of them push down on a thing, but very often 
that little screw terminal thread lifts up the contact, squishes your wire. All right. They look to be in there. Okay, so now um, what I may have just made is a RJ11, if I have that right, I think that's RJ11, to USB. So that would allow me to plug phone to computer or phone to iPhone. Uh, and where I'm plugging that, let me move some stuff here, is this jack right here, like the ones Franklin pointed out. You can see this one's goes like that, plugs in. Now, like I said, unfortunately, this one is just a three conductor one. Um, so I'll need to add, uh, it doesn't even have a little spring uh, terminal end there. So I'll need to add wiring to make that work. I think I'll do that offline, um, but my idea was just to say, okay, if I can simply tap into these wires and they're, they're all just screwed in on, on uh, little blocks here, uh, those are what I would connect to this right here and then have the uh, cutie pie sitting in here with connections to the dial. Right, so that's the idea is to non-destructively edit here, non-destructively change uh, this to have a uh, same plug and just unscrew some things and connect them up. Uh, so I'll leave that be. Um, what I'll do for the short term though, let's uh, do just a regular USB cable coming out. And actually you can, nice, nice thing is you can, since that's uh, free to move out of the way, we can just have a USB cable coming out of this hole and just tuck this inside. Um, so to that end, what I'll do is take this cutie pie right here. Uh, we'll run just a regular USB cable out, and then I'm going to connect this to the dial, and I think I'll use these, uh, a couple of these, in fact, I'll use these very ones, because I don't see any extras that I have laying around. Here's one. Um, I'll use these to just tap onto the dial where it lives. So let's see if that works, first of all. So I'm going to can we still read those when they are connected to the rest of the system? Should, but it's not always the case. So I'm just gonna rest those in there. Uh, and we'll connect those back up. So this was, I believe there, I'm gonna consult my photo I took earlier so I get that right. There we go. Ooh, look, it's inception of. <laughs> so you uh, get that on there. And this one up above. I'll leave the white uh, wires off for just this quick test. Uh, by the way, you may be asking what about switch hook dialing? Uh, for those of you who, who may have been goofing around with these phones back then, the pulse that was sent down to the uh, phone company when the dial turned was the same as the pulse sent when the switch hook went uh, off and on. So you could dial a one, dial a two, dial a three, and so on. It's really hard to get a nine uh, right. But uh, I don't know yet if I'm going to try to try to add that, that would be kind of fun, especially if it had some different function. Um, oh, I got these wrong. Not that it matters, but the, uh, I haven't looked to see where it connects uh, this switch, which wiring comes out of the bottom there. I haven't looked to, to into that yet. Nice bells, huh? Bing bong. All right, so this one, and sorry, you'd be able to see this a lot better if I were using some tweezers or pliers. 
Let's get that. Where are some tweezers or pliers? I think that's not any better. Sorry. There we go. So yeah, so the question I wanna I wanna try to answer right now is if I leave those connected to the uh, rest of the phone and just clip to those terminal screws, will that still work? And I think we should be able to find out with uh, this might be what caused my issues earlier with the uh, board needing to be reset because I think I was trying this <laughs> when this happened, but we'll find out. Uh, so I will go into the phone here, go back to the notes application. And so this should power the board. Okay, so this, uh, when the phone's virtual keyboard disappears, that's a good sign. That means that it is recognized that a USB keyboard has been plugged in. Okay, that works, good. So we can leave this connected, which is neat. Uh, the potential actually exists that you could use this both as the regular phone and as the USB dialer simultaneously uh, because now, other than this switch hook right now, nothing is unplugged. Um, I don't think any, any voltage goes through the dialing mechanism or anything like that. So let's, uh, let's unplug that and I will reconnect the white wires as well uh, just to get them back in place, and those are here, and here, uh, and C. Grover says tapping the hook was a theatrical way to get the operator's attention. Did that make a lot of noise for the operator? Okay, so what we can do now is I'll reinsert these little retention clips of the dial. And I can tighten the screws that hold it to this post at this gorgeous angle. I think this was, we looked at this last time, I think this was the second design basically, uh, the first revision of this phone by Henry Dreyfus, the great industrial designer. Uh, so what I want to do is check, uh, does this one have that same code running on it? I think I, I, think I have it on there. And then uh, I will solder these on like this. So that's just what's going to clip into the system and then have the USB cable. Uh, I can probably test this just holding those in place uh, like so. So let's reconnect to here. And so this one just happens to be a uh, Cutie Pie M0. The other one was a Cutie Pie RP2040. That shouldn't make any difference. And so I will hook into these two dialing lugs here, terminals, and plug USB into the phone. Okay, a little green light, that's a good sign. Okay, I am connected to the wrong I didn't just break it. Maybe that's what I did before. No, probably not likely.
I have, I have done bad things to this board. You can see it's blinking angrily now. Drat. All right, let me, let's go fix that. All right. Whoopsie. Let's head back over here. I uh, hope you don't mind the uh, realistic tour of troubleshooting issues. I'm going through here. Uh, so plug this into the computer. I should see um, these are some little troubleshooting signs. So this one I can double click to get it to bootloader mode and then I should be able to put the uh, firmware back on it. So the UF2 file. So QDPI Pi boot just showed up on my desktop. Uh, QDPI Pi M0 firmware. Sorry, you're not seeing that part, I know. Hello, Johnny Bergdahl. Welcome. Uh, Wagonload says, use a magnet, magnetic read relay if you want to keep pulse dial function of the phone. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Radio Shack touch tone chips. I have a few. Huh? I had one of those. I never did anything with it, but I got one. I thought this is, this is somehow going to be useful. Uh, okay, so now I have uh, QDPi loaded back onto here. Uh, code is code is back on it. Okay, so that's a good good sign. Uh, let's just go test that then again on the phone. Oh, Roy Kaczynski, you got your KB twenty forty keyboard. Excellent. So now, what I did before by accident was I plugged one side of this into the five volt instead of the ground. So if you look closely at the cutie pie, you actually have to pay attention to what you're doing because uh, you probably won't be able to see it in great detail there, but the very last uh, pin there is five volt I meant to go to its neighbor, which is ground, which is how I screwed things up. Okay, so here you can see it has shown up on my phone as a keyboard. You know that because you don't see the virtual keyboard. Uh, I've hopefully got those pinched tight enough in there to contact these lugs. Is it not? Am I not convincing enough? Do I need to solder those in? I shouldn't have to. Let's reset. No. Let's try. Now let's bring this back over to the workbench. Let's see if it's, uh, if the code is really running when I have it plugged in. Okay. Oh, sorry, I went over there and didn't change the camera, so you were not seeing any of that. My apologies. It's okay. It didn't work, so we're back. Um, and wait, am I? Do I have this wrong? What was I plugged into? Was I plugged into 3 volt and not ground? I think that's the case. Yeah, because this is pull up. I bet that's it. All right, let me let me test that right here. Uh, sorry about that. I don't have my my little wiring diagram here. Uh, let's go over to Adam. Let's save this. board. Oh, this one doesn't have HID on it. That's strange. Oh, I did it get, hmm, shouldn't have gotten reset. All right, let me get this board. I, by the way, renamed uh, Cutie Pi. I'm going to re-rename it to Circuit Pi uh, Drive so that it can maybe work with Circup. Let's rename it circuit pi. 
and oops. Yeah, I'm having a problem getting these bundles. All right, that's okay. I will drag it over. Uh, I don't have any J hook alligator clips. That would be fantastic, wagon loads. That would work the best for this for sure. Uh, but I don't. I might have to make some. I don't know if I've ever seen any. All right, back to the bundle. And I could have sworn I had this drive working like that before. Library. Yeah, it doesn't have HID on it. All right. USB HID. This is why I like when Circup is working, because then you don't have to drag stuff around. <laughs> Manage disk space. Okay. Let me delete some stuff off of here. Don't need NeoKey. Don't need Seesaw. This is the issue with the M0 QD5. It's got very little space. Hopefully enough for HID. If not, I will bail. I'm trying to use this one. Okay, HID, good. And now I need debouncer and ticks. Debouncer. And oh no, not enough disk, disk space for that. Okay, so I can't use this M0. Uh, oh, oh, oh ditch that idea. Uh, so in the interest of uh, time, I think we'll bail there. Let me just head back over to the workbench and hook it up the way I had it. And, uh, and then we'll get out of here and I will do, uh, do some of this wiring offline. I'll, I'll make a little uh, wiring diagram for us to reference as well as a guide. So uh, that's what's necessary, if I recall correctly, is the 3 volt and, no, it's ground. It's got to be ground. Let's see if I got that right. Uh, let me grab that USB cable. I have not tried to dial the number that is on here. I don't know if anyone has. I think that's probably, uh, not working anymore, but could be. Yay, working again, okay. So that's the one that works. I think I will um, try the KV2040 uh, since it's got the data lines out. It'll make USB wiring uh, really nice and neat. Uh, and I won't have to go through some adapters. So it could be that or it could be end, up, end up being this KV2040 uh, cutie pie friend here. All right, great. So let's wrap that up. Um, we'll pretend that got put back together, but that'll have to wait. All right, uh, I think that's gonna do it. Thanks everyone for uh, popping by over in the Discord uh, and in the YouTube chat. Uh, the cron job says, hi, it looks like I'm late to the show. You're gonna delay lunch and rewind. Good, well, you'll see us say that later. Uh, good, WIGO connectors, yes. Gonna check that out later, Franklin. Thank you so much for the link. Uh, Timeout is the shorting start to end dial sequence, such as dialing a one. See, Grover, a little five volt solenoid could ring the bell. Well, oh. good thinking. Uh, and Griffin Brooks says, where do I go if I have questions about Adafruit projects? So you can go to the forums. It's, I think, forums.adafruit.com or forum. I forget if it's singular or plural. Uh, so head over to the forums. There's a link on the Adafruit site to the forums uh, on there as well. You can also go to project help in the Discord. So the Adafruit Discord is adafruit.it slash discord. And there are, uh, there's a general project help as well as some more specific ones depending on the nature of your questions. All right, uh, that's gonna do it. Thanks everyone for stopping by for uh, John Park's workshop. I will see you next time and tune in tomorrow for a deep dive with Scott. Thanks everyone.
Bye-bye.